it's very, it gets your attention right here when you see this little kid hit his head. And I heard some of you gasp when you see him hit his head. Because it really, you feel bad when you see a child engaging in an SIB like that. It gets your attention when you see this happen. And everybody feels for him. You have to on a, on a personal level or human level. But problem behavior is not just what you see right here. It's not just aggressing towards staff or injuring themselves or attempting to injure themselves. Problem behavior is probably better defined as any behavior whereby the student is not responding quickly and accurately to teacher-directed demands for relatively long periods of time. And the reason why I make that point is the fact that you see this, this is obvious to everyone, but what about the cute, cuddly kid? What about the kid who goes on, or Amanda, 12 years old, she's now in a classroom, in a mainstream classroom, she doesn't hurt herself, she doesn't hurt anyone, but a lot of the time she's out in Never Never Land, not paying attention, certainly not learning at a rate that's commensurate with her ability, but the fact that she hasn't been that squeaky wheel, she hasn't gotten the oil. And the idea is that our job is to look at each and every child and see how we can help them. How can we improve the quality of their life? So problem behavior is not just the obvious stuff, if they're not learning at a rate that's commensurate with their ability, we've got to go back and we have to address McGill. that. If you look at McGill on page 15, I give you the citation up at the top there. And then the middle slide, I'm going to paraphrase McGill. I give it to you in the handout there. I'm going to paraphrase McGill. What McGill's suggesting, he, what he's suggesting is that he did a, a paper on establishing operations or motivating operations and their implications for the assessment and treatment of persons with developmental disabilities, okay, or, 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 so, or, or uh, you know, problem behavior. What, what he's suggesting is that if we don't do anything to the underlying causes of the behavior, in other words, if we don't address the establishing operation, the underlying cause of the behavior, either directly or indirectly, in the, uh, in the treatment, then it raises ethical implications. Because you haven't done anything to help the child. All you've done is address the problem behavior. So you may address, you may be able to have somebody come in and get him to stop hitting his head, or as I said, put the helmet on him, protect him at that point in time. But if you don't do anything to remove the aversion from teaching that has been created for however it got shaped up, then we probably aren't going to produce long-term benefits. And again, I'm paraphrasing him here, but you get the idea. Our job is to change the condition in the environment. So with that analysis, Okay, with that analysis, if I'm going in to work with a kid like Shane with this profile, the only thing I care about is trying to change the EO. All I want to do is I want to get him to see that, you know what, people in the environment could be fun to be around. I can enjoy being around other I people. Likes. I use the survey that's in here, but I do it so often I don't need to refer to the paper. And I just took the legal pad and I'm saying, come on, help me. What are some things that have an effect on his behavior? Basically, I'm looking for the reinforcers. What are the things... I said, does he like sensory? Does he enjoy sensory activities? And they said, no, he doesn't like anything sensory. OK, how about some food items? Are there some food items that I can use to try to pair up with him initially? I said, yeah, he does like food items, but he's just had lunch and you know, had a lot of potato chips, so he's probably not that hungry. I said, OK, if you leave him to his own devices, what will this guy do right now? If you gave him a choice to do anything in this room, and they told me that there's a ball tree that if you left him, he would put the ball in, and he just basically flaps. So he'll put the ball in, comes down the bottom, and he kind of flaps away, and he will do it for really, really long periods of time, but we can't use it. Because if we bring that out, and you try to take that away from him, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's basically what they said to me. You're going to see the most intense behaviors from him. I said, bring it out. I need, I need the powerful motivation. I need the EO to be really strong. So we brought that out. I'm gonna, you're going to see this little guy start to sign. You're going to hear him try to talk. But if he did none of that, if he did none of that, I would be doing exactly the same thing. Because the analysis is, I've got to try to get rid of that EO. I've got to make it so that there's lots and lots of opportunities for him to see the value of persons in the environment. So I'm attempting to go right back to the basics. Gabby, what happened in the beginning? Pairing with reinforcement. So we identify the reinforcers, and now I'm going to try to provide lots of opportunities to just pair up with positive reinforcement. I'm going to make a, a strong attempt to do that. Just pair up with positive reinforcement. All right. I'm on the floor with him, and I'm just playing around with the ball. The ball, this ball tree is his favorite preferred reinforcer. You'll actually see him saying ball, trying to say ball, and he tries to sign for the ball. He had that before. That was something he had beforehand. And, and I'm just trying to fool around with the ball. I'm just trying to pair. I'm just giving him lots of opportunities with the ball, but I'm trying to do different things with the ball. I'm trying to make 
trying to create some other EOs that I might be potentially be able to use on some level, but I'm just pairing with him, and as I said, I just can't emphasize enough. The fact that you see him trying to sign a little bit later, or hear him try to say some words, even if he did none of that, I would be doing exactly the same thing. So I don't want you to look at it from the teaching perspective. I want you to just look at it from the pairing perspective. Let's pretend he didn't do any of that stuff. I, wa I want you to see what it's like to just go back when you have a kid like this and how you can change the conditions in the environment. You could change the EO in the environment. It's not rocket science when we're working with kids like this. It's not. It's going back and understanding basic principles. He doesn't like being with teachers. Let's change that. Let's get it so that he does like being with teachers because he needs to be around teachers a lot. <laughs> Who's that big guy there, huh? Yeah. I mean, you see him, he puts the ball in, he just kind of flaps away. It's a very, very powerful reinforcer for him. He really enjoys it, so I'm just trying to pair up with that particular reinforcer, just handing him the ball, saying the word ball. I'm actually making a silly sound. I'm like, whoosh. Did you hear him make the sound? Yeah, that's, I mentioned earlier about Generalized imitation, and ger it's so important, generalized imitation is the most important thing that we have as teachers working with kids with special needs, because when the child can imitate, he's just copying the sound, uh, I'm saying, okay, well, if he's trying to do that, what if I do this? Let's see if he'll copy this. So that quickly turns me into the teacher. So somebody asked me before, like, when do you start? Uh, well, what happened is his behavior dictated my behavior, not the other way around. I didn't go in there and say, I'm doing this. At this particular time, I'm doing this. But once I see he's got the smile on his face and he's making that little sound, well, what if I do this? Will he try to copy this motor movement and watch? He does it right off the bat very quickly. I mean, look at a perfect little motor imitator. That one time when he did that, when I saw that, I'm like, oh my God, this kid, that is precise. I've worked with a lot of kids through the years, and it takes, sometimes it takes a really, really long time to shape that up. This kid on the very first trial, boom, right there, very clean, almost exactly the way that I did it. You're going to see me try to fade that prompt, but again, I'm trying to pair. I'm not so concerned with the sign. It's gravy to me. I'm taking it. I'm happy that he's doing it, but it's not the most important piece. So another model prompt. Now I'm going to try to fade that prompt. I'm going to put my hands together, but not actually do the model. F fading the physical guidance. And he gets it again. Now I realize I'm teaching him the American sign for spin. I should be teaching him the Irish sign. So I, I, I try to change it. And I'm saying, no. And he's like, no, I like this one better. I'm honestly applying very light pressure. <laughs> I mean, if somebody looks through the window, they put me in jail, right? But I mean, I, I, it's just like the veins coming out of my neck, and I'm just trying. He doesn't. It's not the pressure that he's enjoying. He's enjoying the interaction, the kind of the faces, and all the goofy stuff that I'm doing right there. But clearly, what I'm doing is I'm establishing: is does he like it? Does he enjoy it? Is there an EO for it? Does he want me to do it? Is he having fun with that? Again, just trying to pair with reinforcement. It's not about the sign. Not about having your head squeeze is the most functional thing in the whole world, right? It's not about that at this point. Remember, it's not about that. It's just about pairing with positive reinforcement. Find things that he enjoys. I now remember, they said you could not take that ball away from him. You couldn't take that ball tree away from him. 
I mentioned earlier that if I didn't know how to manipulate establishing operations, I'm constantly, just like Maureen with Gabby, constantly trying to manipulate establishing operations to teach her language, to increase the number of opportunities for her to talk. I'm constantly trying to manipulate establishing operations with them. I'm very aware of the EO. I'm constantly aware of the establishing operation. So you notice what I didn't do is say, okay, Shane, we're finished with your ball. Now let's come over here and play with Tom's ball. May have had some problems if I attempted to do that. I didn't do that. All I did is I just come over with that ball. Remember, they told me he doesn't like anything sensory. You're going to see how nothing could be further than the truth. I just start tapping on that ball. I'm trying to see if I can get something else to be valuable here. And what told me that I did it? Look at his face right there. That's my, that's my cue right there to get him up on that ball before he knows what hits him and just start to have him roll on the ball. I start off lightly because I'm not sure that he likes it. They told me he doesn't like the sensory stuff. You'll see that nothing could be further than the truth. But I manipulate the establishing operation. Yeah. yeah, bump your noggin, bump your noggin. Uh, my colleague's in there, she's looking at me like, you realize what you're saying? The mother's in the room. Yeah, bump your noggin. That's a good thing to be teaching this kid, bump your noggin. So now I realize I'm trying to talk my way out of it. I don't know if I was successful, but... I don't know. That's the kind of noggin bumping. EO. I, when I stop the ball, that's the condition in the environment that momentarily increases the effectiveness of rolling on the therapy ball as a reinforcer and evokes all behaviors that have been reinforced. Now, I'm teaching him to sign for the roll. He signs for it. Now, watch. I'm going to stop the ball again. What I need you to see is that, yeah, I'm having fun with him. I've had people say, oh, you know, you're good with kids and you have fun on the floor. And, you know, and I do. I, don't, I wear that as a, a badge of honor. I enjoy having fun with kids. I think that's probably one of the secrets to working with kids with developmental disabilities. Don't ever forget that they're kids first. Yeah, they're kids with autism, but they're kids first. And let's go back and realize what typically developing children like to do in the natural environment, have a lot of fun. But more importantly than that, it's not just about having fun. You see how if you're just having fun with Shane, just like Maureen having fun with Gabby, giving her the Play-Doh and letting her play with the Play-Doh, that's a lot of fun. But the reason that we're there working with her is that she has significant deficits. We need to provide practically significant numbers of opportunities to increase those particular skills. And the same thing with him right here. So when I stop the ball, I'm creating another EO, which gives me another opportunity to teach him, in this particular case, the man for the role. Now, I don't know if you noticed there, but did you notice how he didn't look, he didn't see me modeling the sign at that point in time? Now, I'm very much aware of every single thing that's going on with this little guy. So what are two things that we know about Shane? You're seeing this live. Yeah, Learns fast. So cognitively, how do we know that? He picked, first of all, I, he, yeah, exactly. I show him the sign the one time. So he's a great motor imitator. We know that, right? He's a great motor imitator. And then... Cognitively, as was pointed out, yeah, he's getting it pretty quick. He didn't even look at me that time. He signs, so now I, now I try to fade it even further because that was a vocal prompt. He heard the word roll, so now I fade the prompt completely, and he signs again. So I'm like, now, okay, this little guy's got tremendous ability. He's not confusing. He's, not dis you know, he's discriminating between the two. So you know he's got a lot of potential at this point in time. I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. Yeah, right? Yeah, I'm going to do a little bounce here, another different side, just manipulating EOs again. We talk about getting hundreds of opportunities to man. Yeah, I was trying to get the EO for the tickle. So 
Roll him on the ball. Now he's going to say, okay, let me see if I tickle him a little bit, see if he likes to tickle. Look at, how, look at how important functional communication is. He's basically telling me that, no, I don't want that at this point. He may like to tickle, but it's not as strong as the roll. I want to do this. So now he's able to tell me what it is that he wants at this point in time. Functional communication. It's not just a matter of being able to make motor movements or being able to say words in Gabby's case. It's being able to do so under conditions that make your life better. I'm going to fast forward. I do a lot of different things with him. I think it was almost an hour. He learned about seven signs, didn't make any mistakes, didn't confuse or scroll with, the, with them. You'll see she's showing. My colleague is actually showing with the video. You'll see him do the little sign there. You also notice that he's trying to say just about everything. In fact, what I'm, what I'm trying to do now is figure out the last piece of the puzzle for me before we can start to put together a program for him. I know he's a great motor imitator. I know that cognitively he's a kid that can pick up things pretty quickly, so I've got those two pieces. I get a sense of his profile there. The last thing that I don't know is, is his language intelligible to an unfamiliar listener? And I'm looking for like 80%, but it has to be with an EL. It has to be with an EL. Because that gets to the issue that you were talking about before, whether the child's unable to do it. It's a difference between being unable to do it or unwilling to do it. One's structural, the other's motivational. So now what I'm doing is I'm trying to create the strong EO, and I'm trying to see when the motivation is strong, this little guy wants whatever it is that we're attempting to do, what's the best he can produce vocally? Is there enough to work with with the vocal procedures? Or Because you heard him say roll, you know, a couple of, well, uh, what was the other one? Um, the swing, you didn't hear him say the swing yet. Uh, the, uh, the ball, you had the ball. He's kind of leaving off the L's at the end, but he's not, not too far off. But the issue is, if we had the strong EO, can we shape with vocal procedures and through practice? He never had it before. Do you think he was trying to say words very clearly while he's at the table? You think he could care, he could care less? The last thing he was trying to do was, was, was talk there at the table, but you see how when you start manding, the only form of verbal behavior that benefits the speaker, and he's trying to give you the best that he can. So I'm trying to figure out this last piece, and I'm going to do a couple of different procedures with him just to try to test that out. In fact, let me jump it ahead here. You notice I didn't reinforce right away when he said roll, uh, when he said roll, when he signed for the roll, I didn't reinforce right away. Normally I would, I get really excited, do it real quickly. Now I'm, I'm sort of slowing it down. I'm trying to see whether he'll give me the vocal and what that vocalization would be, what the quality of the vocalization would be. Uh, and I'm playing with that a little bit. Yeah, he wasn't hitting his head, but he needed a neck brace when we were finished. <laughs> and he's trying. You can see he's looking at that point. He's trying. He's giving you the best. You see how the EO matters when you're trying to assess a child? I never knew what that meant when, I, when my daughter was very young. I never understood. I never even heard of that term before. But I used to be frustrated when you go to a neurologist and you're trying to figure out, you know, a neurologist is making a, some determination about what, what Alicia could or couldn't do. And I'm like, how, how can she know when she's obviously upset because she's in the doctor's office and she's trying to get out of the doctor's office? Like, how could this person make a, a reasonable decision? And it used to frustrate me. I didn't know how to talk about it intelligently, but it would frustrate me that she wasn't able to really assess what she was capable of doing at that point in time because her escape trying to get out of the doctor's office was interfering with the assessment. Um, but you see how regardless of whether you're a speech language pathologist, occupational therapist, teacher, whatever the case is, if you understand how to manipulate establishing operations, you're going to have a better chance to see what the child truly can do. What's the best that they can produce? It'll be a little more clear in this next example. No, it's not that I'm skipping it. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I, al I already know that he's a great motor imitator, and I know that cognitively he's a kid that can, is going to pick up a lot of signs. He's already proven that. Seven signs in whatever, 45 minutes at that point. So I already know that that's not the issue. Now, I know where that is. But what I don't know is do we really need to use sign? He may be, with the, with the EO really strong and a lot of practice, we may be able to shape up his vocal verbal behavior to get the adult form of the word. 
And I'm trying to figure that out. And you'll see how it becomes more clear that it's not the case. You'll see how augmentative communication is needed. Yeah. I think that's because you were told that you didn't like any kind of sentences. Yeah. You set it up so that it was all kind of sentences that you were supposed to I, I would have done, like, remember what Deanne was doing with the ball and, and just having fun without having to make it a sensory thing for him? If he truly was aversive to those kinds of things, I was going to try to have some fun with him in different ways. So I wasn't necessarily going to do that. But what happened is when I started tapping on the ball and he came over, that was my opportunity to say, okay, he, he obviously has some interest in the ball right here. So if I put him on there and I just roll him lightly, he may like that. And I see I'm looking at his face. I see that he's happy with that. Okay. So I'm not really concerned. In fact, I very rarely look at any paperwork, <laughs> what the diagnosis is. I honestly don't care. If I'm going to an IEP meeting, I care. If I'm going to just go in there and evaluate for myself, I need to figure it out for myself. Skinner said that this is an inductive process, moment to moment interacting with kids. It's better to study one rat for 1,000 hours than 1,000 rats for one hour. I hate to talk about rats and kids in the same breath, but the idea is that <laughs> It's not a statistical analysis that matters. Basically, it doesn't matter what's best for 80% of children with autism. If it's not working for Shane, it's not working for Shane, and you better figure it out. So it doesn't matter what the book says or what the recipe says or what the statistical analysis is. It's up to us to figure it out. So regardless of the diagnosis, I mean, so many places in the world, I mean, I travel a lot of places, and those things are so confused, even in the States. I mean, I, when I was teaching, I taught for about eight years. I taught for about eight years. I left education to go into business for myself. I owned a couple Irish bars on the Jersey Shore. Thought that's what I'd be doing the rest of my life. And then when Alicia was diagnosed, I went back to school. Not for the purpose of ever doing this. I never thought I'd ever be doing anything like this. I just went back initially to try to figure out ways to help her out. And then one thing led to another. I started to do more coursework, started to enjoy not only helping Alicia with her profile, but also trying to share some of it with other people. Um, I, when it was shared with me, it made a huge difference in my daughter's life. And I just felt that it's important to share it with others. If you know that there's something out there that can help kids and you can explain it in a way and maybe, I don't say this in a, uh, you know, like, I don't know, in a, I don't hate to say it like in a bragging way, but I, I think because I know what it's like to be a deer in the headlights, to not have any clue whatsoever how to help somebody like that, and particularly with my daughter, when no one has more motivation to help her and I have no idea, no clue how to do it, the fact that I was in that position enables me to go back and realize that other people are there too. Now, how can we explain that in a way that's truly the difficult challenge? It's not about the science. The science is here. We know how to do it now. This is not guesswork anymore. There's years and years worth of science. We can show how to do this, not just the language piece, but managing behavior. It started off with adults with very se severe, serious self-injury, like ripping their scalps down to the bone and eating objects like nuts and bolts and nails. If you ever go to one of Dr. Iwata's workshops, he shows the x-rays of people who engage in that kind of behavior, pica and things like that, and even more gross things that I'm not going to talk about right after lunch. So really nasty stuff. But, but there are only four functions of behavior. And what was you know, tested out, what those functions were tested out initially, and the protocols that were established apply to every one of us in the classrooms. There's only four. And really, the two most prominent, speaking very loosely, kids do things to get out of negative reinforcement or to get things, positive reinforcement. They tantrum, cry, scream to get tangible items, attention, activities, or the one that's most common is to get out of, getting out of demand, social negative reinforcement. So we understand that now but it doesn't necessarily get into the hands of people like yourselves. And needless to say, that presents challenges when you're in classrooms with kids like Shane and you don't have an understanding of that analysis. Yeah. Typically, do you get your input into their development and strategies or even your environment that you're diagnosing at that point? Uh, regardless of who, who it is, if I'm working in the home, I, I, I do, but most of the information garnered from interviews, and indirect measures like that, it's highly unreliable. In fact, Dr. Iwata makes a point when he talks about functional assessment and the different types of functional assessment, that interviews and intake, it's nice to be able to get the basic information. That's how I use it, but it's unreliable information. It doesn't mean that they may not be right. They may be right, but it doesn't mean that it's reliable information. So I take that, I listen to it. I have an intake form when I do the behavior workshop. I do a managing behavior workshop. I modified one of his intake forms, and we use that. It's a little more layman language for parents or teachers who may not have experience in, in behavior analysis. Um, and I use it for intake. 
so I do get the input. I think it's important to get the input, but it doesn't matter what the parent says. It doesn't matter what the teacher says. I need to know, not guess. I need to know what the function of his behavior is, not what somebody thinks the function. If they really had a good handle on it, the likelihood is it probably wouldn't be happening. So, standpoint. Let me just finish this last um, this clip. You'll see where it becomes more apparent. So, not great. The key, the key that you have to think about is, is his language intelligible to an unfamiliar listener without contextual cues? That's where it's tricky, right? That's where it's tricky. Yeah, you see how it's not. And, I, and, I'm, and, and it's hard for us because we're really happy. You kind of know what he wants at this point in time, but you almost have to have your back turned to him like it would be a para who doesn't know him. Have the back turned and without the contextual cue. So he's, she wouldn't be seeing the ball rolling or what we're doing. And is his language intelligible? And you'll see how it's not great at that point. But it becomes even more clear in this next example. Is there an EL present? You betcha. I sound like Sarah Palin, right? No, you betcha. Clearly an EO. He's got the big smile on his face, belly laugh. He wants me to bounce that ball. But when I say bounce, watch how he can't produce it. He can't even come close. Okay, so I'm not going to frustrate him. I cr it's clear to me right now that he is not somebody that the vocal procedures, if you just went to the page where teaching vocal words as man and you continue to do that, you might be able to reduce the behavior for him, and you would. You clearly would. But the problem that you'd run into is if you continue to reinforce poor articulation, you're going to get what you teach. You're going to get poor articulation. It's the same. If it's easier to get it by woo, 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 rather than bounce, you're going to continue to do more of the same if it's reinforced. And that's one of the dangers of parents not recognizing the value of augmentative communication to shape up and to strengthen, but it should be done within the context of manding, and that's not necessarily done in a lot of programs. Some of you may be hearing the man for the first time. How many people are hearing that term for the first time? Yeah, I mean, it's sad. It's sad that we graduate people from special education programs, and they've never even heard of that. And yet, the, in, the implications for persons with developmental disabilities are enormous. I just, it's a relatively small part of our science. Many people think that ABA is synonymous with discrete trial training. How many people thought that, you know, that you hear, D, you hear DTT and it's ABA? Boy, that is so unfair. That is absolutely unfair. It's a huge part of our science. It's a very important part of our science. When I go back to the case study with Gabby, you're going to see how Gabby learned a heck of a lot. In fact, most of the real learning took place during the discrete trial format. We have to get the kids to the table. We have to be able to present materials in an efficient, organized way, be able to collect data, measure that. We have to be able to do that. So the goal is to get the kids to the table. But ABA is not synonymous with discrete trial training. ABA is not a program, despite the fact that there are many people that market it or promote it as such. It's not a program. It's principles. It's, and when you understand the principles, you don't need a hired gun coming in to figure out what to do with kids like Shane. When you understand the principles, you can then apply those principles to novel situations. In fact, education has its roots in the Latin word educo which means to draw from within or to bring out, to educe, to grow through use. I think sometimes we look at education as accumulation of degrees and credentials and we, lots of initials. But if you can't apply, you could pass a test maybe, but if you can't go in there and show somebody how to use those principles, then you're probably not going to be the best person to oversee someone's program. You have to be able to use it, and you have to be able to use it in novel situations. You have to be able to understand the principles so you can apply those principles across environments, across kids, across populations, and that's very different than passing a test and having a credential. I mean, I've seen that lot, you know, a lot of examples like that where, you know, teachers in the classroom, and there's somebody who may have impressive credentials, but they've never worked with kids. They've never been spit at. They haven't been covered with chocolate pudding or, you know, been beaten. You know, they haven't had those kinds of experiences. And if you haven't had those kind of experiences, then you know what? Take your notes and you can put them, leave them at the front desk, you know, that kind of thing. Get in there and show me. If you can help me that way, then the likelihood is I'm more, uh, you know, I'm more able as a teacher to, to help. It's not, about, it's not about a specific disability. The reason why I can say with great confidence 
And I don't care who the person is, I don't care what the credentials that person has sitting across from me, I can say it in any venue or any forum, that applied behavior analysis is the most effective treatment for children with developmental disabilities is because it's a single subject design. When it's turn to work with Shane, I gotta figure out Shane. And Shane versus Shane, not Shane versus other four-year-olds in Ireland or whatever the case is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It matters is how can we help Shane with the existing problems that he has as it relates to his deficits, whether they're language, whether it's social deficits, whether it's behavior issues, which clearly it is in this example. You see how it's Shane versus Shane, and Shane is very different than Gabby. And Gabby's very different than Rachel, and Rachel's very different than, you know, whoever else the other child is. So it's principles and being able to apply those principles. But if you understand the analysis, it opens up a tremendous world to helping kids with developmental disabilities. And really, none of the principles are just with kids with developmental disabilities. They apply to typically developing children. It has nothing to do with the disability. It's just more important in the sense of a more molecular analysis and when we're working with kids with developmental disabilities to be more precise that way. So any, any other questions? Any other hands up? All right, so I mean, you can hear right there very clearly. That's pretty much all I need to see with him to be able to set up a program. And what I s simply say to them is, let's get rid of that table. Let's forget about the table at this point in time. We can go back there. We'll get there. We need to get there. But right now, in his life, it's not that important that he puts that puzzle piece in. It's not that important, even that he mans at this point. I need him to like you. <laughs> I need him to want to come in and see you and say, boy, I can't wait to come into this room as opposed to the other way around. If I were to come back into that classroom the next day, do you think he's trying to get away from me or is he going to approach me? But the science is the science is the science. So she has a history with him, but if it happens, like if you have a situation like that with kids and it doesn't have to even be the aggressive, self-injurious stuff, if the kid's not coming willingly, go back and change it. That's what McGill that's what McGill is making. That's the point that he's making. That article is a great article for people who work with, with children with special needs because it makes the case. We've got to do something to the underlying conditions. If the kids do not enjoy being with the teachers, I, I, I really struggle for, for a good analogy. I, I, I wish I could come up with a better one, but I only think about it at the time I say it during the workshop, and then I kind of forget about it when I leave. But what he's saying is that for whatever reason, that table became very aversive. And teachers and teaching is aversive for Shane. He hates it. He literally hates it. And all day long, he's exposed to this unpleasantness of instruction. Anymore. If you don't do anything to the underlying cause, if you don't do anything to change that aversion, then you haven't done anything to help the child out long term. You really haven't done anything. And the part that, the part that uh, I struggle with sometimes within our field, I think our field has done a a very poor job of explaining a lot of what I've just explained to you. You can see how it's not easy to just you know, cover some of these things. In, um, if you look on page 14, I want to get to some of the real, real key pieces here. In fact, go to the bottom of page 13. In the book Applied Behavior Analysis, Cooper, Heron, and Heward, which is a Bible of applied behavior the analysis, Bible, in chapter 3, if you're going to buy the book, and I think if you're in classrooms, it's a great resource to have for a school district to have. It's a pretty expensive book. It's about a hundred and some odd dollars or so. But it's a tremendous resource to explain a lot of what I'm sharing with you and give lots of examples of how it can be used across wide ranges of kids. Yeah, exactly. That's the book right there. In chapter three, it was in chapter eight of the older version. If you're going to buy the book, buy the 2007 edition or above. If you don't get it on eBay, get the 2003. If you buy the 2007 edition or above, you're going to see there's a full chapter on establishing operations. Previous to the 2007 edition, it was rarely mentioned in our field. So it's relatively new in terms of being able to have more exposure of what I'm sharing with you in that regard. Mark Sundberg also has a full chapter on verbal behavior. So the idea of the man, the tact, the introverbal, you know, the whole, whole idea that we're going to start to analyze to analyze language based on function, introduce people and prospective teachers and therapists uh, with that analysis. Armed with that analysis, you're a better teacher. Clearly, you're a better teacher when you understand. But in chapter three, the authors attempt. They attempt to address the issue. Why? No? Okay. They attempt to address the issue of, we have kids with developmental disabilities. What goals and objectives are we going to target who makes those decisions, and what are they predicated upon? So basically, we have kids like Shane. We have to write IEP goals. We have to work on stuff, right? We've got a kid with a severe developmental disability. We need to help him out. What do we do? Who makes the decisions, and what are those decisions predicated upon? So what they did is they started to go back into anyone who's written on that topic from all different fields, 
you know, speech language pathology, medical journals, whatever the case was, anybody that had anything to contribute could offer their, their support or research, whatever the case may be. And they went back all the way into the 60s, like as far back as the 60s, I believe it was back, as far back as the 60s. And on the bottom of page 14, I believe it is, yeah, four, no, 13, I'm sorry, 13, there's a slide there that says habilitation. And they kind of gravitate around that one paragraph there as being a common thread or a nice example to precisely talk about the importance of that issue. And I'm paraphrasing, it was by a fellow by the name of Hawkins. Is it in there, Hawkins? Yeah, on the bottom, you barely see it. A fellow by the name of Hawkins in 1984. And I'm paraphrasing Hawkins, but pretty much what Hawkins is saying is that we need to select targets. Remember, the broad issue is what targets do we select? Who makes those decisions? What are the decisions predicated upon? What, Haw what Hawkins suggests is that we need to focus on goals and objectives that produce the most amount of reinforcement in a person's life. We need to select targets that are going to give them more opportunities for reinforcement in their life in the short term and in the long term and minimize punishment. Minimize punishment in their life in the short term and in the long term. And don't just consider the children, consider the caregivers of which you are one or we are one. So whether you're a parent or a teacher, it's not just about the child, it's about life in the home, quality of life issues. When you think, of, when you think about it within that context, when you, when you put it within that context, it really forces you to take a look at the value of the man repertoire. Think about it. This is our field of applied behavior analysis, and not everyone shares this, this analysis. Not everyone would start. There's a lot of ABA programs that start off with, here's the book, here's your book of SDs, here's your PECS book, let's now do ABA. And there's a 40-hour-a-week program at the table doing discrete trial training. And as I said earlier, that is not applied behavior analysis. It was never meant to be more of a marketed approach to that science, but that's missing some valuable pieces. And it also moves away from the way typically developing children learn. That is not how children typically are typically developing, or how typically developing children are learning in the natural environment when they're very young. They're not. They're not learning at the table with formal instruction at that point in time. They're learning in the natural environment by having lots of fun with their parents and with their teachers and with other, other people. So I think we need to look at the analysis in that way. But you see how when he sums it up that way, it forces you to take a look at what are we doing? What are the goals that we're working on? And are they developmentally appropriate? Do they make sense? You work so hard. I mentioned earlier, I'm in classrooms all the time. No one appreciates how hard you work more than I do, those of you that are teachers. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm in classrooms all the time. I see how hard the work is. I see what it entails doing that. You're in there day after day, week after week. Some of you are working with the same kids year after year. How is it going to make a difference in their life when you're no longer there? How have they acquired skills? How are the skills that they've acquired going to make a difference? How is it going to add quality to their life when you're no longer there? You see how when you look at it within that context, it really forces you to take a look at the manned repertoire. We've got too many kids that are 10, 12, 15 years old beating the heck out of people, can't ask for a glass of juice, and people are worried about them doing still structure. They're continuing to worry about the structure rather than the function of language. It's, it really lends itself, and I think our field needs to do a better job of explaining that, teaching prospective teachers the importance of functional communication, the analysis, and then incorporating that into programs. Otherwise, what happens is a lot of these behaviors that you saw with Shane, that's not the result of his autism. It's not the result of his autism. Those behaviors are the result of the conditions in the environment where that behavior has been reinforced. And it's a completely different analysis. And unless you go back and, and change that, the likelihood of him enjoying the a quality of life as time goes on is going to be very slim. Even if you did get him to stop hitting his head, even if you got him to stop hitting his head, if he still wants to hit his head and he's not learning, you see how that's what McGill's talking about. We got to stop him from wanting to hit his head so that we can provide practically significant numbers of opportunities to teach him. It's not just about minimizing or reducing behavior. It's about providing practically significant numbers of opportunities for him to learn. Okay?